Jesus' name. Life's made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. and welcome to Trinity. My name is Kyle, and whether you're worshiping with us in person or online, I want to thank you for taking part of your weekend to spend a little time with us. You can let us know you're here today by either filling out the flap on your bulletin and dropping it in the offering basket when it goes by later in the service, or by checking in at trinityreston.org hub. If this is your first time here, we want to extend a special welcome to you. So before you leave this morning, stop by the information table to get a free gift. You can find everything you need to know about what's happening at Trinity by visiting the Trinity Hub at trinityruston.org. But right now, I'd like to take just a few minutes to share some of the great things happening around Trinity. Next Sunday, July 31st, we'll have one worship service in the Trinity Center at 10 a.m. to close out Weekend of the Cross. We'll hear from youth and adults who participated in the weekend and have a great time celebrating all that God is doing in our community to help those in need through this fantastic weekend. If you're still looking for a way to help with Weekend of the Cross, we've got a couple of great ways for you to help. First, consider purchasing a few cases of bottled water for work crews to have while on work sites. And then second, we're also looking for people to loan us tools for use on the project sites. Tools we need include post hole diggers, ladders, circular saws, power washers, drills, and anything else you think we might need. If you've got something you think might be useful, label it with your name and drop them off by Wednesday, July 27th behind the Trinity Center. 
What does it mean to live life in the Spirit? If we look to the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, we can find some pretty big clues. In one of the great chapters of the Bible, Paul describes what it looks like to live a life under the Lordship of Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Beginning in August, Pastor Doug will be preaching a sermon series on several of the key passages found in Romans 8, encouraging us to look at our faith in a new way. And how would your life be different if you lived through the power of the Holy Spirit? Thanks again for joining us today. We know that God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel His love in a new and fresh way. Remember to stay connected with us throughout the week on Facebook, Instagram, and at our website, trinityruston.org. So have a great week, and when you come back, bring a friend. Okay, just in case you missed the announcement, next Sunday, one service in here, 10 o'clock. So 10 o'clock in here. Uh, the traditional service at 9, we'll meet in here as well. So. Uh, one big party next week, bring a friend. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning gathered together as your people, ready and willing to worship your name, uplift your sovereignty, proclaim your glory, give you all the honor and praise. Yet as we gather together, we are reminded of our shortcomings, of our failures, of our sinfulness. We are reminded that we are in a world of suffering and pain and that sometimes the torment seems too much to bear. God, we confess that Sometimes it's our fault that the suffering and the pain does not escape us. Sometimes it's not our fault. Sometimes we cry out to you. We wonder where you are. Where is the Lord God Almighty? Does God hear me? Does God see me? Is God there? We wonder in our anguish if you care. We are like Abraham, who will follow you to an unknown land, to the land of promise, yet on the way, we will begin to follow our own thoughts, our own methods. We are like the Israelites, who complain about the freedom you've given. We are like Moses, who could be in the midst of miracles, who could perform miracles by your hand, and yet go on and try to recreate miracles by our own power and will. We are like the disciples, faithfully following Jesus, and questioning him every step of the way. And we are like Jonah, who actively go against where you've called us to go. Yet thanks be to our Lord Jesus Christ, Savior and King of the universe, who was there with you in the beginning when you created all things, when you came into the chaos and laid the waters still. When you came into the chaos and provided order and reason. Out of that creation, out of that mercy, and out of that love, we cry out to you now. Strengthen us in our innermost being. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Put within us the calling and the passion that was there at our creation. Fan it into flames, embolden us to follow through, to have the courage and the strength to go where you've called us to go, to do what you have appointed us to do as your followers. And remind us, as you reminded Jonah, that 
Sometimes the fish gets appointed to swallow us up. Sometimes prayers get answered in unlikely ways, in unlikely means. Because you are sovereign over all of creation. All of creation is under divine appointment. Continue to light that fire within our soul and give us the boldness to go out and proclaim the love and the grace of your Son. It's in Jesus' name. And when our words fall short, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now stand and sing his praises.
that Michael was saying is it's important that we remember the story. We remember everything that our God has done for us. The God of creation, the God of everything, who spoke everything into existence, except for us. Uh, we were special, he made us with his bare hands, and then has followed us throughout history. Not being surprised, I wanna make sure everybody, this is important. He's not surprised by anything that's been going on. But guys, it is up to us to spread the love, to spread the message to this dying and broken world that so desperately needs him. Because he first loved us, let us take that love and spread it to the world. creation there at the start before the beginning of time with no point of reference you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light and as you speak
failures and pride On a hill you created The light of the world Abandoned in darkness to die And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. Where you lost your life, so I could find it here. If you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in every. As we invite you to be seated, as we invite you to come forward for this morning's offering, there's uh, baskets here. We invite you to come down, and as you come down, uh, please come down and pray uh, if you feel so inclined. And somebody will be passing baskets uh, along well if you'd like to stay in your seat and pray there. Would you pray with me? Father God, we ask that you would receive this blessing this offering, that you would bless it, that you would teach us how to use it to further your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
My friend Pierce got a watch for his birthday, and this morning he asked me two questions. When will you start preaching, and when will you stop? <laughs> 11.34 is the start time, Pierce. Hear this passage from the book of Jonah, the second chapter. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in on me, and the deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed on me forever. Yet you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. 
As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you and to your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. One of the joys of this prayer series has been the podcast, which we release every Monday. They've been just, they've been a blessing. And I want you to watch a clip from tomorrow's podcast. Uh, no siblings. And so the the idea of, of selfless love, you know, I, I um, yeah, moving 635 miles away from you know, my home where I grew up, uh, a place where I have very deep ties to, there was a lot of resistance mm-hmm. on, on my part. Um, and, and it was something that I, that I really struggled with, but I knew that I needed to be faithful. And I knew I needed to be faithful to, uh, to God. I knew I needed to be faithful to my wife. And, um, you know, it was, it was really, one of those God hitting me over the head with a, this is an opportunity for you to exercise selfless love and to be sacrificial in, in what you're doing. Um, and I don't know that I had done a very good job of demonstrating that, you know, um, uh, as, as I grew and as I matured. And, and so it was a, um, while it was scary, um, you know, it was, it's kind of hard to explain, but there was a peace that I felt even in the midst of the turmoil and the doubt and the fear of, um, you know, while this is 100% not in line with what my vision was for my life or my family's life, um, I knew God was leading us and I needed to follow. You can find the full edition tomorrow at, on our website. I love the book of Jonah. Uh, I relate to Jonah very well. Jonah was a professional preacher and a prophet, and God said, Go, Jonah, I want you to go over there and preach to the Assyrians at Nineveh. And Jonah went to Joppa, went to the cruise terminal to get a ship to Tarshish. God said, go. Jonah says, I've got my own personal needs, desires, plans, and agendas. I'm going this way, God, because we all know God will not hold us accountable when we don't do the things that God's commanded us to do, right? Right. So Jonah gets on the ship, cruise ship. He's running away from God. A storm comes up. The superstitious sailors decide there's a problem person on board. We better find out who has caused these problems. And sailors came up with a scientific method of determining who caused the problems. They cast dice, uh, cast lot, shot dice, whatever you want to say they did. The lot fell on Jonah. Jonah said, it's me. I know what you're going to do. So they unceremoniously threw him off the cruise ship into the sea. And God commanded a great fish to come and swallow up Jonah. And right there we turn the story off. Because we've caught some big ones and we've told some big ones, but we have never seen a fish big enough to swallow a whole prophet And Jonah prays from the the belly of the fish, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. And fish has about enough of Jonah, spits him out on the shore, and Jonah goes on into Nineveh, and he preaches, and it is like the most half-hearted sermon ever preached in the history of half-hearted sermons. He walks into Nineveh. It's three days journey across the town. He walks in about a day and a half and he says, 40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. Amen. Let's go home. That's not a powerful sermon, is it? Well, the king repents. The king makes a proclamation that all the nobles will repent. The king, the nobles, every human being, every animal, 
every flur, every herd, every flock, everybody's going to repent. So in Nineveh, we've got bovine repentance going on. I don't know if you've ever seen cows at an altar, but there was an altar call, call and the cows came. I mean, we got everybody repenting. And again, Jonah gets upset about it because he says to God, look, I left, I fled from your sight at the beginning for I knew you were a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. Everybody in the book of Jonah obeys God except Jonah. And that's the first reason he found himself in the belly of the fish. And one of the things we need to learn in our prayer life and in following God is this little word called obedience. We don't like that word, obedience. It doesn't happen so much now, but for years there was just an outbreak of, of couples who would come to me. They were, you know, meeting with me, doing the premarital counseling thing. And invariably, it was always the female who would kind of sheepishly say, I have a question about the wedding ceremony. When we get married, do I have to promise to obey? Hmm. And I reassured her that the word to obey, that, that phrase had been taken out of the vows in 1844, that we don't do that anymore. But you better bet you I ask, talk to me about that and tell me why that is a concern for you. We don't like obedience in our culture. We see ourselves as grand free agents that whatever we decide obviously is okay because we've decided it. And after all, we're a people of love and mercy and grace. We don't talk about rules, laws, and obedience in the Methodist church. That's somebody else. Except Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jonah obviously didn't do what God wanted him to do. He went the other way. And God said, okay, Bubba, you want to be a muley prophet? I'll take care of you. And so sometimes from the belly of the fish, we, we, we get an opportunity to repent. We get an opportunity to look at our own lives and say, what did I do wrong to allow myself to be in this circumstance? And, you know, sometimes we do things and there are consequences of our actions. Sometimes we find ourselves in the belly of the fish through no fault of our own. We're just in the belly of the fish. Or if you like the image better, we're praying up against a wall. People go, now wait a minute. I don't want to pray up against the wall. I come to church to learn how to pray so when I'm up against the wall or when I'm in the belly of the fish or when I'm in a dark place, I can pray that and boom, I am released. I come to church to get some relief. And the problem is, if we're honest, we all go through seasons of our lives when we're in a dark place, when our prayers go about that high, when we feel as though God has abandoned us and we want to know what are we doing wrong. I wonder if Jonah thought that in the fish because he never really repents in all this. He's just calling out to the Lord. So I want to look briefly, and I'm looking briefly because... Um, I know I'm being timed now by a new birthday watch. I want to look briefly at, at, at praying in the belly of the fish and what we can learn from it. What we can learn from those times in our lives when we're up against a wall, when we're living through what I would call desolation. David in the 13th Psalm says these words, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day long? How long 
Shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death, and my enemy will say, Yeah, I prevailed, and my foes will rejoice because I'm shaken. David suffered so much injustice at the hands of King Saul. He had to live out in the desert for years. He had to forage for food. He slept on rocks. And he was hunted like a criminal for year after year. Yet he faithfully served King Saul. He refused to lay his hand on God's anointed. He risked his life as a soldier in Saul's army. When Saul got depressed or went through one of his crazy things, they got David to come in and play the harp. David never was disobedient to the king. He always submitted to the king's authority but he was in a dark place and if you read Samuel you'll see that David spent one of those dark times in a cave it got so dark that his soul had to go to this place and just be by himself the Bible and indeed Christian Mystics and Christian spiritual guides have talked about a period of desolation. What happens when we live through dark times? What happens when we pray up against the wall? Well, the first thing that happens to us is we become self-aware. When rotten things are happening to you, when you're praying through a dark and difficult time, all, the, all, all that's phony and fake in your life tends to be stripped away. You are who you are in the presence of God. You know the story in Luke 15, the younger brother who wanted his daddy's inheritance and he took the money that daddy gave him. He went off into the far country and squandered that money on riotous living. And the Bible says that he ran out of money and there was a famine in the land and he began to be in want and he was hungry and he attached himself to a rancher and the rancher grew hogs. And it's not a good thing for a Jewish boy to be a hog wrangler. And his job was to slop the hogs. And this little Jewish boy was so hungry and so desperate that he was about to put his face into the pig slop and eat. And the Bible says, and he came to himself. I can imagine Jonah sitting in the belly of the fish, having several epiphanies, several moments where he came to himself, where he had moments of self-actualization and self-realization. He realized who he was before God, and he realized his flaws, his sins, and his opportunities. So we become self-aware. The other thing that happens to us when we find ourselves praying against the wall or praying from the belly of the fish is we grow out of our casual thinking. Y'all, we have such, I don't know, I, I call them the cross-stitch mavens. The cross-stitch mavens have taken over the church. You know the ones that cross-stitch these nice sayings that you put on your wall? Yeah, one of my favorite ones is, when God closes a door, he opens a what? You've heard it? I'm not the first one. When God closes a door, he opens a window, right? Yay, it's right there in the Bible somewhere, isn't it? No. It's not in the Bible and it's lousy theology because it turns us all into cat burglars. No, God's closed the door, but they left the den window open. Let's sneak in. Well, Brother Doug, I've seen it on cross stitch. Lifeway has it. It must be true. Hidden in the book of Acts is the story of Paul who wanted to go to Macedonia, who wanted to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to Asia. And this is what the book of Acts says. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia Having, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. 
God shuts doors. Quit rattling the doorknobs. Uh Uh-oh. When you're in the belly of the fish, when you are praying against a wall, you sometimes realize how bad your thinking is that you believe cross-stitch and not the Word of God, that you have, have been inculcated by slogans rather than inspired by the Holy Spirit. When we're praying through hard times, when we're praying from the belly of the fish, we also learn to move from our feelings to what the book says. Sometimes I feel like I'm not very much of a Christian. And sometimes on Monday, people come visit me, and after they leave, I'm not very much of a Christian. And sometimes when I preach, the sermon goes zip. And I did all that just to see if our transcribing software will transcribe what I just said. Sometimes I don't feel it. You know, we developed a whole culture around feelings. You can't trust your feelings. You need objective reality. You need something solid to stand on, something that will never disappoint you, something that will be there when you don't feel it or feel like it. What's Jonah praying? He's praying that he once again will face the Lord in the temple, that God would hear his prayer, that he could again worship. Y'all, we need to grow. We need to grow away from our dependency on feelings. Ken Davis wrote a book several years ago, and I just love the title of the book. It's entitled, I Don't Remember Dropping the Skunk, But I Do Remember Trying to Breathe. And it's just a book of of his journey through life. And he was in an education class in college, and as happens, his lesson for that day was to teach while the teacher watched him teach. And he decided for his lesson plan, he would uh, share with the class, his fellow education people in the college, he would share with the class the law of the pendulum. And the law of the pendulum basically is that you can release a pendulum and it will swing and it will not return to the place where it was released. It will return a little less Swing some more and come back and it returns a little less because of friction, air resistance, and gravity. The pendulum is always constantly slowing down. And he had PowerPoints and algebra and trigonometry. And he had a little video that illustrated it. It was a wonderful illustration. And his professor was sitting in the back of the class just glowing. This young man gets it, how to be an educator. All oh, these kids are going to just love him as a teacher. And then he said, "Is do you, do you believe in the law of the pendulum? And everybody in the class, yes, we believe in the law of the pendulum. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he says, well, I want to illustrate it. And he's called the professor down. And he said, prof, will you come sit here over against the wall in a chair? And the prof said, yeah, I will. So the prophet sat professor sat down and he said, do you believe in the law of the pendulum? I believe in the law of the pendulum. Well, Ken Davis had a living, breathing illustration. He had rigged up before class those round metal weights that we used to lift at the gym. I never understood why, but we did it. He had 250 pounds of weight on a string suspended from the ceiling. 
And he walked the weights over to the professor and he put them about an inch before he got to the professor's face. And he said, do you believe in the law of the pendulum? And the professor with drops of sweat starting to beat up on his forehead very meekly said, yes, I do. Ken Davis let go. And the pendulum swung all the way across the room and it started back and he said, I've never seen a man move as fast as that professor moved out of that chair. And he caught the pendulum and he said, does he believe in the law of the pendulum? No. Ken Davis said, now, do any of you believe in the law of the pendulum? And finally, sitting in the midst of fraternity brothers, one pledge suddenly believed, raised his hand, I do. Come on down. Put the pledge right in the chair. Pull the pendulum all the way to his face, about an inch away, and let go. He stepped on the other side of the pendulum while it was going across the room so he could stand there and watch. And sure enough, the pendulum stopped two inches short. And he said, that young man believes in the law of the pendulum. Our feelings, our fears, our hopes and our dreams will sometimes disappoint us and very often deceive us. We need to understand the law of grace. And that's what happens sometimes when we're praying against the wall, when we're praying from the belly. We, we have self-awareness. We grow out of our casual thinking. We move beyond dependency on feelings. And we learn to endure the Greek word for endurance is hupomone. Hupomone is the picture of a soldier standing at the, the most intense part of the battle. The battle is coming to him. He is bearing the slings and arrows and rocks and stones and torches and whatever they would throw at ancient Greek soldiers. He is bearing it. He is not moving away from it. He is standing his ground. He is standing his place. Jesus said... Jesus said, by your endurance, you will gain your souls. Y'all, sometimes we're praying for situations that aren't going to resolve, and we know they're not going to resolve the way they want to. Sometimes we're praying out of a situation that we got ourselves into. Sometimes we're praying out of a dark place in our soul, a dark place in our spiritual journey. This is not surprising. It happened to some of the greats in our scripture. It happened to David. It happened to Jeremiah. You can see it with some of the apostles as they minister that they get caught in what is called the dark night of the soul, but they keep on trusting and believing and reading and worshiping and practicing their spiritual disciplines. They keep on praying because those prayers, those prayers in hard times, those hard prayers we pray, change our lives. And they get us ready for what happens next. I love the book of Jonah. Because Jonah prayed. And the fish spit him out on dry land. And I love the book of Jonah for the third chapter. The first verse. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Saying, get up. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it what I tell you. Brothers and sisters, God's not finished with any of us. God is still in the process of redeeming us. He's still in the process of having his grace active in our lives. Sometimes we pray with 
brightness and all is birds singing and cool breezes and bright colors. And sometimes we pray from the belly of the fish and it's those prayers, those hard fought, often desperate, tough prayers that change our lives, that sustain us, that allow us to continue this journey of faith because we don't pray alone and we don't walk alone. Would you stand and pray with me? God, we thank you that you hear us when we pray. We thank you that you hear the good prayers, the easy prayers. And we thank you that you hear us as we pray through difficult times. Oh God, we pray that our hearts would be changed. That our hearts and our thoughts and our lives would be pleasing to you. And we pray in your name. Amen.
peace and may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you. Amen.